Well, you're, you are here today, and we are wrapping up our series on the end times, the last message in our end times series, and today I'm speaking about heaven. So I hope that this series has been a series that you have enjoyed, something that maybe you've learned, or at least been encouraged. How many of you say that's, that's been the case? If there's any of these messages that you missed, I would encourage you to go back and, and watch them, re-watch them, share those videos with your friends. I think that there's timely uh, messages that, that encourage us in a world where everything seems to be turning on its head and we're going how do we make I mean we're scratching our head going how do we make sense out of what's going on in the world open the Bible it it makes a lot more sense if nothing else it encourages us that God's still in control and wherever we're at on that timeline we're going to continue to put our trust in him we're not going to get discouraged by what's going on. We need to not look to a government. We need to not look to people. We need to look to Jesus. And we have an opportunity to be a light in a dark world where it really impacts and makes a difference. And that's what we're talking about today. Man, we've got the view of, of eternity, and today we're talking about heaven. And I'm excited to share with you this message as we wrap up this series. Uh, I want to start by looking at the beginning of the Bible, and then we're going to compare and contrast with the very end of the book. So we're going to be looking at the beginning of Genesis, and we're going to be looking at the end of Revelation. So you can open up the covers of your, of your Bible if you've got that, and we're going to be looking at both of those right here at the beginning. Human history began in paradise in the Garden of Eden, and human history will all end in paradise in the New Jerusalem. John recorded this in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, the next to last chapter, he said, he who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done, it is finished. I am the alpha and omega, the beginning and the end. What began in Genesis is brought to completion in Revelation. And so as we look to uh, the end of the book, as we look to heaven, here's the contrast and comparison that I'd like to make for you this morning. Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. In Revelation 21, John said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. In Genesis, it says God made two great lights, one to, one to rule the day, the sun, and one to rule the night, the moon. In Revelation 21, there is no need for the sun, for it says that the glory of God illuminates the city. In Genesis, night was established. God called the light day and the darkness night. In Revelation 22, it says there is no more night there. No more night. In, in Genesis, the seas were created. He called the dry ground land and the water seas. And in Revelation 21, one, it says that there was no longer any sea. So I'm sorry for all you beach lovers. No more seas when we read the end of the book. I don't understand that. Maybe there'll be rivers, maybe lakes, ponds. Maybe there'll be a waterfall. I, I don't know, but this has no more sea. In Genesis, the curse was announced that there would be pain in childbirth because of sin, that the ground would be cursed, and so many other, so many other curses. In Revelation 22, no longer will there be a curse on anything, the culmination of, of, of man's existence here on earth. In Genesis, death enters history. In Revelation, no more death, no more sorrow. In Genesis, man was removed from paradise. In Revelation, man was restored to paradise. It says that man will be permitted to enter through the gates of the city and eat again from the tree of life. In Genesis, sorrow and pain began. In Revelation, no more crying, no more pain. God said, I'm making all things new. Do you look forward to going to heaven? Wow. Do you look forward to going to heaven? Man, are you serious? This is, this is what we have to look forward to. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Amen. 
What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. And he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, a glorious day that will be. I only changed keys three times in that song. <laughs> there you go. It's as good as it gets. But what an exciting thing to look forward to heaven. What a day. It's not just a song that we sing about. This is reality. If you, if you want those notes, just snap a picture of that real quick. That's an easy thing to do. I saw people with their phones, and I had some people say, hey, I didn't get a picture. I saw people do it. I didn't know what they were doing. There you go. Go back and look up those verses from Genesis and Revelation and see uh, the restoration of all of that. So this morning, as we talk about heaven, to guide our discussion, I want to ask some questions. And uh, so our first question that we're going to ask this morning is, where is heaven? I want you to know that heaven is a real place. Heaven is a literal, tangible place. It's not just a state of mind like a lot of people would, would say that it is. Jesus said this in John 14, in my Father's house are many mansions or many rooms, depending on which version that you read. What they're saying is that, it, that there's more than enough room in God's eternal home for, for his people. And Jesus continues by saying, I am going there to prepare a, a place for you so that you will always be with me where I am. In Revelation 21, it emphasizes what John saw. John saw this with his literal eyes. Revelation 21, 1, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. In verse 2, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. Throughout the Bible, it speaks of heaven's existence and access to heaven through faith in Jesus. But there's no verses that give us a geographical location for heaven. So we're answering the question, where is heaven? Heaven seems to be up. So many verses that we read about that refer to heaven. Psalm 14, 2 says the Lord looks down from heaven onto the entire human race. In Acts chapter 1, verse 9, when Jesus was caught up, when he ascended into heaven, it says that he was taken up into heaven. In Deuteronomy 26, it says, now look down from your holy dwelling place in heaven. But we know that up isn't where God dwells. Because the Bible tells us, and it refers to the fact that God is everywhere. Solomon said this in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 2, but who is able to build a temple for him since the heavens, even the highest heavens, cannot contain him? David said in Psalm 139, if I go up to heaven, you're there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. He said, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. God is everywhere. Well, where's heaven? Heaven is a real place. Heaven is a, a, as real of a place as Urbandale, Iowa. Heaven is as real of a place as your home. Heaven is a real place filled with real people. It's a, it's a real place and we will have real bodies there, glorified bodies. When Jesus rose from the dead, he rose with a glorified body. And if you'll remember Jesus in his glorified body, he walked through walls. He did. I'm not telling you that's what you're going to do. But a glorified body, it's going to be very, very different. He could pass through walls, but he could still touch people. He could still eat. It will be a different existence from what we know now. But I would say that it will be a more real existence than anything that we've experienced here in this world. This world that we live in is temporary. It's temporary and it's decaying. And contrary to popular education or science, this world isn't evolving and getting better. You can look at everything around you and see that we are in a state of deterioration. Everything is not getting better, it's decaying. The second law of thermodynamics establishes the concept of entropy, which is a lack of order or predictability, a gradual decline into disorder. I want you to think about it. Even our lives become more complicated and gradually decline into disorder rather than remaining simple and structured. Life is unpredictable. And some of you, when you got up this morning, you were reminded this body doesn't do what it used to do. It's not getting better, 
Things are decaying, things are declining. Nothing in this physical earth is going to last. Nothing remains. I want you to think about it, very little about what we have from 100 years ago. What do we have that's 100 years old? We make a big monument out of something that is that, that old, right? We don't have much because things are dying, things are decaying. We like to have nice things and it's okay to enjoy those nice things, but we can't get too attached. Those things aren't permanent. Don't drive your tent stakes too deep into this, into this world. We're just passing through here. We have all, all we will have in eternity is our soul and the things that we store up, our treasures in heaven. Jesus said this, don't store up treasures here on earth. Moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there is the desires of your heart. They will be also. Let's talk about our heart. In 2 Corinthians, Paul said, it's, it's God who makes us stand firm in Christ. He anointed us. He set his seal of ownership on us. He put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. So the Holy Spirit of God that resides in us, we are the temples of the Holy Spirit. He made a deposit in us. That spirit will lead us into truth. The Holy Spirit will guide us and direct us, will comfort us, and will empower us. He has given a little bit of, of eternity into our lives right now. Jesus taught us to pray in Matthew chapter 6, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. To seek God's kingdom coming to earth is to declare that we have a great need for God's presence, for his love, for his redemption, and we have been given a mandate that we are to carry the kingdom of God with us everywhere that we go. You have the kingdom of God. Eternity. We, we're gonna last forever, not here in this world but our souls will last forever. And God has made a deposit in us. And we're to release that kingdom wherever we go. We're called by Jesus to take the kingdom of heaven to this world. What would it look like if just a few of us were to say yes truly to the calling of God in our lives? To live for more than just worldly pleasure and comfort. To step outside of ourselves and live with an eternal perspective. Listen, we're called to be lights in the world and I think that would shine brighter than anything. We have an opportunity to bring the kingdom of God. We are bringers of the kingdom. We're ambassadors to the world that we live in. We're ambassadors to our children, to our grandchildren. We, we have that responsibility. We're called to take that message, to take that light. You are, you are, you are made to make an eternal impact far greater than you can imagine. Every one of you. You're made to make an eternal impact far greater than you can imagine. And God wants you to use uh, the, the release of his love, his grace, his mercy, his peace, and redemptions to other people who are in desperate need of him. God wants to take your five loaves and your two fish and multiply it. We need to say yes to partnering with the Holy Spirit and allow God to, to, to change the world, to bring his kingdom to earth through simple acts of love and obedience. So where is heaven? Heaven is where God is. It's his presence. Hell, on the other hand, is a separation from God's presence. What is heaven like? The Bible doesn't give us a whole lot of information about what heaven is like, actually, but we get some images, some pictures of heaven. We get some images comparing it to life here in this world. Here's some facts about heaven that you'll have on the screen. Heaven is God's dwelling place. Heaven is the Father's house. It is where Christ is today. The Bible tells us that he ascended to heaven and he sits at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. Heaven is where believers go in Jesus when they, when they die. Uh, it's a city designed and built by God. Great people of faith that we read about in Hebrews chapter 11 agreed that they were just foreigners, that they were nomads here on this earth, and they were looking for a better place. They were looking for a heavenly home. Heaven 
is a perfect place. The Bible tells us that the streets are made of gold, that the city gates are made of pearl, that the walls are made with precious jewels. I can't even begin to imagine that. All these images used to describe a place that's so much greater than our minds can even imagine in our wildest dreams. There's an old story of a rich man who on his deathbed negotiated with God to allow him to bring some of his earthly treasure when he came to heaven. And God's reaction was that that was a a pretty unusual request. But since this man was exceptionally faithful, uh, he granted permission to this man to bring just one suitcase. So when the time arrived, he presented himself at the pearly gates, suitcase in hand, actually in both hands, because he had stuffed that suitcase full of bars of gold, as full as he could get it. Very heavy suitcase. And of course, as most of these heaven stories go, he meets Peter at the, at the gates, and Peter says, sorry, you know the rules. You can't take it with you. That was the same reaction I got in the first service. We all know that you can't take it with you, right? Okay. But this man protested. He said, God said I could. He said I could bring just one suitcase. And so Peter went back, checked, and found out that that would be an exception just for this, for this one person. And so he said, okay, I got to examine the uh, contents of your bag before you pass. So we find that heaven does have TSA as well. And so Peter took the suitcase, he opened it, he saw the gold bars, and he questioned him sarcastically. He's like, you brought pavement to heaven? Imagine packing your suitcase and the the treasure of your heart is chunks of concrete and rocks. That's, That's what gold is in heaven. That's what streets are made with. When John tells us that in heaven streets are paved with gold, he's saying that heaven is such an amazingly incomprehensible place. It's something that we value so highly in in this life like gold. It's used to pave roads. It's just giving us a glimpse of what heaven is like. Question number four, what will be and what won't be in heaven? Revelation 21 tells us that he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain. No sun, no moon, no night. There's no evil. There's not anyone who practices evil. It tells us that only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life will be in heaven. In heaven, there'll be no crime or violence, no courts or jails because there's no criminals. There's no greedy politicians. Hey, if I say something in this list that you agree with, just just say amen, whatever. You're going to find a lot of good stuff here. Think about this. What we're going to miss, what won't be in heaven, some things that will be. No greedy politicians. No drug dealers or child molesters. No wars, no bombs, no terrorists, no dictators. No pollution, no potholes, no power outages. In heaven, there's no tears, no sorrow, no regrets, and no remorse. There's, there, bitterness is, is gone forever. Failure is left behind, and there's no more pain and suffering. Paul said, I reckon that our present sufferings are not worth to comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. He's saying, it It will be worth it all. Everything that we've been through, everything that we're going through in this life, heaven will be worth it. It'll be worth it all when we see Jesus. I'm not singing that one, okay? (laughs) There'll be no eyeglasses or braces, no wheelchairs or crutches, no false teeth, no hearing aids. There'll be no more hospitals, no nursing homes, because no one will grow old and no one will be sick. No aspirin or Advil ever again. No more accidents, heart attacks, or strokes. No cancer. No COVID. There'll be no more cemeteries and no funerals. No one's going to die. We live forever. This is heaven. I can only imagine an abundance of parks and streams and mountains, flowers in constant bloom, fruit trees of every kind, every species of plant life, and no weeds. Precious stones lying on the ground like playthings. Look, gravel will be things like emeralds and rubies and diamonds galore. And we'll just be walking on that stuff not thinking about it. Conversations filled with laughter and joy where everyone only tells the truth. 
That should get an amen. There'll be no more lying, no deception, no gossip, envy, jealousy, selfishness, or anger. It will be so much more wonderful than we can imagine in our wildest imagination. Heaven is a real place, and I'm going there. How about you? Amen. So God knows that we're coming. Jesus has prepared a place for us. Listen, you could go to the swankiest resort. You could go to the most expensive hotel, and it won't even come close to the place that Jesus is preparing for you for all of eternity. That's exciting stuff. We'll be with God forever. Question number five, who will go to heaven? The movie from the 1980s told us that all dogs go to heaven. (laughs) But what about people? There are a lot of different ideas that people have about heaven. The popular opinion is that heaven is the better place where we all go when we die. How many of you heard or maybe have even said they're in a better place? We may know that. We may not know that. We don't know. If they go to heaven, it's a better place. But our culture acts as if the default destination for everyone, for all humanity, is heaven. Ten years ago, a controversial pastor by the name of Rob Bell, he wrote a lot of books, some of you have heard of him, he published a book called Love Wins. And in his book, he said that love wins in the end and no one actually goes to hell. We all go to heaven. What does Jesus say about that? What does scripture say about that? Jesus spoke a lot about love, a lot about love. But he also told us that we need to have a healthy respect and a healthy fear of God. In Matthew 10, 28, Jesus said, don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body, for they cannot touch your soul. Fear only God who can destroy both your soul and body in hell. According to Jesus, hell is a real place. It's a real place that we need to avoid. He doesn't just reference hell in the Gospels. He describes it in great detail. Here's a few references to to hell. It is a place of eternal torment, a place of unquenchable fire where the worm and maggots never die and fire never goes out. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's a place of outer darkness. Jesus talks about hell more than he talks about heaven. And he describes hell a lot more vividly than he does heaven. There's no denying that Jesus knew and warned us about the absolute reality of hell. Hell's not a place where God sends those who are especially bad. I think that's where a lot of people, well, Hitler, Hitler probably would go to hell. We, we, we reserve hell for some, some place for somebody that just is exceptionally bad, but hell is the default destination for everyone who lives apart from Jesus. Everyone is on that path. Wide is the, is the path that leads to destruction. Narrow is the path that leads to life. Narrow is the gate that leads to heaven. Listen, so we're on one path or the other. Because of sin, we're all guilty and we all deserve God's eternal punishment. We need someone to save us because we all stand condemned. Jesus came to save us. He came to forgive us. He came to rescue us from the punishment for our sins. John 3, 16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him wouldn't perish but have eternal life. John 3, 36 says, anyone who believes in God's son has eternal life. Anyone who doesn't obey the son will never experience eternal life but remains under God's judgment. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Listen to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. He said, don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or commit adultery or male prostitutes or practice homosexuality are thieves or greedy people or drunkards or are abusive or cheat people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. He's pretty blunt. Some of you were once like that. But he says, but you were cleansed. You were made holy. You were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. Aren't you thankful? 
that while all of us deserve hell, while all of us deserve eternal punishment, Jesus came and made a way. Jesus came and took your place. Jesus came and paid the price and took the penalty for your sin and for my sin and for everyone's sin. And all we have to do is accept him. How can I know for sure that I can go to heaven? Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is hell. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Paul said in Romans 10, 9, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Listen, that is a promise. Everyone, he says, who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. No one's excluded. First John chapter five says this, and this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. This life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. So it really just comes down to this. Jesus has prepared a place for all those who belong to him. I go to prepare a place for you so that you'll always be with me wherever I am. Problem is, we can't get there on our own. Our sin completely separates us and there's not one of us here that is immune from that. All have sinned, all fall short of God's glory. And the wages of that sin is death. That's what we deserve. But God has given us a gift, eternal life, a gift, a free gift of God. It's by grace that we're saved, through faith, not of ourselves. It is the gift of God so that no one can boast. Listen, we talk about heaven. I want all of you to go. I don't want to miss it. And we can know for sure that we're going to heaven by making Jesus Christ the Lord of our life. I want to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I don't want any one of you today to miss if there's anything in your life, anything that you know right now that you say, Pastor Jeff, if Jesus were to come back, we've been talking in this series about the return of Christ and we look at the things that are going on in the world and it's not hard to connect the dots that we're nearing the end of times. I can't tell you when. It could be any minute. I don't know. But none of us are guaranteed the rest of today. None of us are guaranteed tomorrow. And if something were to happen and Jesus were to return, do you know for sure in your heart where you would be? in eternity. Today, if you don't know, you can't say for certain, don't, don't take a chance. You can know before you walk out the doors of this place today that where you are going for eternity, and it's all been determined already by Jesus, what he's done for you. It's just a matter of you taking that free gift and saying, yes, Jesus, I'll take life. I'll give you all my sin, and I'll take the life that you've given to me. I become righteous in his sight as if I never, ever sinned. It's a great exchange. It's the best deal you're ever gonna find in the whole wide world. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed and today you don't know for certain what your eternal destination is. And you say, I wanna, I wanna know, Pastor Jeff. I wanna know that I'm going to heaven. I wanna partake in the gift and the blessing, the incredible eternity in heaven with Jesus. Not going not going to hell and you say that's me pastor jeff I'm, I'm i'm asking jesus to forgive me of my sin and come into my life today if that's you would you just raise your hand and hold it up i want to pray with you today thank you anybody else listen don't miss this opportunity if you're watching joining us online you you pray this prayer with me too anybody else For those that raise their hand today, you wanna to pray. Just pray this prayer with me, something like this. Jesus, thank you for taking my place, paying the price for my sin. You died on a cross and you took my sin. You died in my place. Thank you. Thank you for loving me when I wasn't very lovable. Thank you for making a way for me 
be part of your kingdom here in this world and to experience eternal life in heaven someday. Be my Lord, be my Savior. Forgive me of my sins. I accept you in Jesus' name. That's something to rejoice about. There are several people this morning who have a different outlook than they came in here with. To know for certainty that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, man. It, may, it seems so simple, but we make it so hard. So here's the challenge that I wanna, I wanna make to the rest of you today. We have been commissioned and called to be the lights in this world. We've been commissioned and called to make a difference, to, to bring the kingdom of God to earth, let the kingdom of God like shine through us. We, we carry and keep the Holy Spirit in our life. We're temples of the Holy Spirit. If we've been saved and we made Jesus the Lord of our life, wherever we go, whatever we do, in our conversation, in our actions, our attitudes, everything, we, we have an opportunity to shine the light of Jesus in our homes, with our children, with our grandchildren. We, we show the light and the love of Jesus. Today, if you're challenged to say, look, I, I need to live with this view and this perspective of heaven, like I just find myself going through motions and I'm committing today to let the kingdom of God shine through me, that I would be a light in this world everywhere I go that I'm taking God's kingdom wherever I go in this world and you're committed to say, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna have conversations with people. I'm gonna let them know about, I mean, if you got the best deal on the planet, why wouldn't you tell people where to find it? You know the best deal, it's free. If I were to tell you they were giving out free outrageous candy bars at Hy-Vee today, <laughs> which they aren't, you could ask them, I don't think they are. But if I told you that, I know that, I know that several of you would just swing on by hy V to get a free candy bar. Listen, this is life-changing stuff. How many of you say you commit to living with eternity in focus every day? You do so by just standing. Would you just stand if that's you? You're saying, I'm gonna, I'm gonna commit to live in eternity, in, in view of eternity, every day of my life. I'm gonna let the light and the love of Jesus shine through me. Listen, we've got so much to look forward to. We've got heaven awaiting us. I don't know if, if Jesus is gonna return this week, tomorrow, a year from now, I don't know, but we need to be looking for him. We need to be ready. In the Bible, there was a parable of 10 virgins, 10 bridesmaids. Do you know that five of them, they were watching, they, were ready. they weren't ready. That was the church. They were waiting for the bridegroom to come to take them to the wedding, and half of them weren't ready. You remember that story? Hey, they were trying to borrow some oil from the others. Hey, can you lend me some little bit, little bit of oil? And they're going, no way. I'm not taking a risk at missing this. Go get your own. Go, go down to the store and get some. Guess what? They didn't make it back in time. We need to be ready always ready, live, living with our life in view of heaven and Jesus' return. How many of you are ready to go home? Man, we're gonna sing this song as a celebration. I haven't even looked at the time, but I guarantee you, you're out earlier than you were last week. <laughs> Let's sing this song about home and make it a celebration. How many of you have ever been on a vacation and you knew it was that vacation just got to the point where you're going, I just wanna go home. I just want to go sleep in my bed, my own bed. Can you imagine what beds are going to be like in heaven? Hey, we don't sleep. There's no night. I don't know if we sleep, or, but there's no night. We'd heard that. I don't know. It's going to be so amazing. It's going to be awesome. I don't want to be, I'd rather go home and walk on streets of gold than what we got here. Man, this third world, fourth world country called Earth, heaven is so much better. Let's go there. Let's take people with us. Amen. Tonight, tonight we're culminating our series with a night of worship. And I encourage you to come back tonight. In heaven, there's going to be a lot of worship. 
We're gonna, we're gonna worship and it's gonna be amazing. I don't even understand that. Some, some people said, yeah, I you don't know, sing all the time. I don't, think, I don't think it's gonna be like that at all. It's gonna be something otherworldly that we just, but we're gonna be in the presence of God all the time. So tonight I encourage you to come back in the presence of God. We're gonna just spend some time worshiping. We're gonna, we're gonna do some praying, intermittent prayers for things, but we're gonna to gather together and, and worship. There's gonna be some songs from throwback from old times. There's gonna be some very contemporary songs. It's gonna be something that all of us would enjoy and appreciate. I encourage you to be back here at six o'clock tonight. Be back tonight. If you're, if you're uh, not in a class, I encourage you to check out some glasses that are happening right after this. But have a great day. Be back tonight. Let's keep heaven in our focus. Let's go there. Let's take people with us. God bless you. Have a great afternoon.